many ways, environmentalism can often look like a homogenized movement, one that tends to focus on ideal diets, zero-waste efforts, or second-hand goods. But it's important to remember that sustainability looks different for every person, and the above examples, while valuable, don't always encompass every person. Marginalized communities, be it through disability, race, color, income, and more, are disproportionately impacted by environmental problems. So, when we conspire efforts to care for our environment, it's so important to take a step back and ask the question of, who is being left behind in this discussion, and how can we create spaces that advocate for everybody's well-being? Until we pay equal attention to all its aspects, we'll continue to remain stagnant in this movement. This dialogue wouldn't be complete without understanding privilege. The discussion of privilege has been coming to light much more, but at the same time, it's easy to lose its nuances in why we identify it in the first place. Acknowledging one's privilege doesn't mean invalidating an individual's personal set of experiences or hardships. Instead, it's acknowledging the spaces where one has a systemically advantageous position. Do I have access to green spaces like parks or community gardens? Is it safe and is it clean? How are my essential living needs such as healthcare, water, food, and shelter being met? And are they meeting the standards of what I need to be healthy? For example, I can have a home, but is it located in a community that experiences significant air pollution? Or I may have running water, but is it clean or drinkable? Do I have the financial capacity to choose sustainable brands? What is my ability status? Do my abilities allow me to use existing sustainable alternatives easily? And thinking on a global scale, do I live in an environment that's more susceptible and vulnerable to the effects of the changing climate? Ultimately, it's asking, is there an existing problem that I'm able to turn my head away from because I'm not directly affected by it? The purpose of addressing privilege is to understand that there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Environmental challenges are uniquely defined by each person, and suggesting otherwise only perpetuates injustices for certain communities. The needs of some have been historically sidelined, and those matters need attention. Now, we're grateful to share a conversation with Trisha Barbarona from Shades of Sustainability, a BIPOC-initiated and oriented community project that engages in environmental work by offering peer and intergenerational learning opportunities. I'm Trisha. I use they, them pronouns. I'm with Shades of Sustainability, and I'm one of the co-founders of them and we started back in 2019 and we're still going strong today. We were um, basically a community project that stemmed from this program that was a part of this organization. So the org is called Apathy is Boring and so from there we were tasked um, to create a community pr um, project essentially that would highlight under the theme of environment. We like co-created what is now Shades of Sustainability, where we have this focus um, of amplifying BIPOC voices in the environmental movement. Looking at us, we are a group comprised of people of color. And oftentimes you don't hear a lot of our voices um, in anything to do with environment. And I've been in several different spaces like that, where it is a very predominantly white space, or it only really talks about issues that I can't really speak to or don't really reflect my own experience or the experiences of everybody else in Shades. Um, so we wanted to create that space because we wanted to be able to hear ourselves and be represented because we we see, we know um, that we are disproportionately affected by um, the environmental crisis, whether that's here locally in Vancouver or you know back in our own homelands where we um, or like the people there are also experiencing such different levels of environmental racism and um, uh, like different aspects of the environmental crisis. For me, like the topic of food insecurity is something that's so um, very prominent in my life, not because like, I faced it myself, but because I think just generally to kind of paint over the broad brush, um, a lot of like BIPOC cultures are so integrated into food and like our cultures are so deeply um, ingrained in that, that, you know, not having food, not having those resources to nourish us, to nourish us, whether that's like, you know, physically, whether that's um, nourish us culturally is really disheartening. And um, 
especially here um or just like in the world really there's like so much food waste and we could essentially be feeding the world twice over um and nobody should be going hungry there's just way too many communities that are food insecure children that go to school and um are going to school hungry you wouldn't want that for your own family you wouldn't want that for the people in your life so why would you want that for the rest of the world i'm particularly passionate about um, learning about like gentrification and homelessness and like the um ties to the two i think that's for me at least that i see when i go out um that's like one of the most prominent things um that i notice is the increasing gentrification of a lot of communities now we see in those places are these big condos um that provide housing for a lot of like affluent people which you know when you look at it in a very simple lens it seems like oh it's just people wanting housing but um when your housing is so unaffordable and it is created at the expense of putting people who once lived there on the street because they can't keep up with those prices, they can't um, access a very basic standard of living. That's something that um, needs to have a much deeper comprehension, essentially. So um, a lot of BIPOC communities who are you know, one of the more disproportionate numbers um, of like homeless people in Vancouver are being left out of the conversation when it comes to um, like affordable housing. It's, we want, well, what I would like to see is the reclamation of like those lands that once belonged to a lot of like black and indigenous people um, who, once lived there, who wants to thrive there at one point or another. Our Stories and Our Futures is a project that creates um, space for BIPOC voices to reimagine the futures um, that's filled with new system and new systems, new ways of being um, that are grounded in our history, our knowledge, our ancest ancestral traditions. Um, and we wanted to open the conversation for BIPOC youth to show us that vision and show us what um, is a just, equitable, joyful future for them. Um, and so our submissions looked really promising. Some of them um, were um, talking about wanting to just be safe, safe out in public, um, safe to just be who they are. and. They were also filled with um, people talking about embracing the uncertainty and protecting future generations from the pain that we feel now and the pain that our ancestors have felt. And um, also working in balance and harmony with the earth and with ourselves and our communities. So a lot of that project was um, so uh, positive, but also um, conducive to what we are like living in the realities that a lot of us are facing um, and how we all kind of just yearn for that um, you know peace and to be able to not struggle anymore I think nobody wants to struggle ever um, and so that's kind of essentially what our stories and our futures is in a nutshell the environment is something that we experience with all our senses. We see it, we hear it, we we touch it, we feel it, everything. Um, and art essentially is that. It's a, a, it's so broad that you can touch it, you can feel it, you can hear it, you can see it. Um, you can do all of that. And our understanding, I feel like, with environmentalism and just um, learning about it is so um, connected to art. I don't believe that, you know, radicalizing yourself with theory is enough. I think being like experiencing um, whatever it is to do with um, the environment, whether that's like your own lived experience or just even the lived experience of the people in your community, um, it's, it's so vital to your own learning and to your own knowledge. And one of the ways that you could do that is by either creating art or 
um, seeing art or learning from it um, and essentially consuming it. It's, it's a mode of learning that really reaches a lot of audiences. And that's why I think it's so important um, that, you know, not only do we like read theory, we look at um, concepts like this and read such bulky academic writings because no one's meant to process that. I feel like humans are very um, big visual learners and auditory learners and we're just you know we have to be able to experience something in order to really understand it and so that's what art really does for us especially with environment and learning about it. So Big Talks with BIPOC is um, that was our launch event so to speak. It was an event that allowed um, people to have the conversations of like different aspects of um, their own lived experiences in, um, in the environmental space. People were able to talk about um, what it was like, what sustainability looked like for them growing up or what they still practice today. Um, and a lot of folks spoke on um, you know, things that their parents used to do that they do now that they were probably once shamed for. Like for example, some of us talked about um, you know, buying from Value Village and thinking that like, oh, you know, it's not, it's not new and it's, it's like old and hand-me-down and used and things like that. And a lot of people would feel very shy about that. And I know I would be going from that perspective to seeing it as like a cool, hip, new, trendy thing. Um, but then there's also other people who shared stories about like even their parents and their parents' ways of practicing sustainability that wasn't cool hip you know here's a reusable straw in a in a mason jar to bring to your bubble tea shop it's like uh you couldn't afford plastic bags so when you go to the market you had to wrap your veggies in newspaper and tie it with string and carry it with you home going back to those stories we wanted to really highlight the importance of like the passing of like traditional practices that have been around for so long um, that are now being like revitalized as like cool new trendy things. I think that was one of the one of the bigger main themes that we also talked about during that event. The fact that we don't hear our voices, we don't see ourselves in um, movements like the environmental movement, for example we are disproportionately affected by so many aspects um, of like racism and inequality but we are not you know as in in the room where it happens so to speak so i believe that it is a really good thing to emphasize our voices and essentially we could be in the room where it happens there is a lot of space for us you knock down those four walls and let the rest of the world in um, and that's why it's it's just really important that we knock down those systems that was created and cherry picked and hand painted for the rich white cis man. Um, and we fill those categories with people like us, with people who um, don't get a say, who often get erased from the conversation, who get pushed to the side or, you know, used as like the token. Now we'll move on to our discussion with Stephanie Allen. She is currently the Associate Vice President of Strategic Business Operations and Performance for BZ Housing and the founding board member of Hogan's Alley Society. Together, we'll learn more about the problems of gentrification, displacement, and discrimination in Canada today. I'm Stephanie Allen. I'm the Associate Vice President of Strategic Business Operations and Performance at BC Housing. I'm also the acting chief research officer, and I've been on special assignment over the last year and a bit on um, the homeless encampment um, support for uh, in Vancouver and, and liaising with my colleagues in Victoria. And then also uh, a founding member of the Hogan's Alley Society and on the board of that organization. The Hogan's Alley was a nickname given to the black kind of population that lived in the edge of Strathcona. That community formed kind of the late 1800s, early 1900s and grew 
Um, it was a place where black people lived because they weren't welcome in other areas of the city. There was also a close proximity to the railroad where a lot of black men had the very difficult labor of working as porters on the train. It was also the area where a lot of non-white people lived in Vancouver at the time because you know, we've got uh, a history of a lot of folks that live there, the Chinese community, Japanese community, at the time, Italians and Ukrainians were not really considered fully white. And so they also lived in this community. And it was, you know, a place where people could kind of find the housing that they could not only afford, but that they weren't, you know, they were facing discrimination elsewhere. That discrimination uh, materialized as, you know, sorry, we can't rent the house to you or the apartment to you, but it also was um, enacted in legal documents and registered on title. And many neighborhoods in Vancouver um, actually had restrictive racial covenants on title that said this house cannot be sold and there'd be a list of racialized uh, groups there. With some money that the city of Vancouver had, they planned the replacement of the Georgia and Dunsmere viaducts. And when they were gonna replace it, they decided to turn it and root it right over the heart of the black community. Over decades of neglect, the city said, wow, look at this, this is this neglected place. It looks like a, you know, a slum forgetting that they themselves contributed or, or you know, failing to acknowledge and admit their role in creating a slum. And so because it was a slum, it was then targeted for removal under the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation's urban renewal program. And that was that these blighted, racialized communities should be cleared to make way for infrastructure projects. Those infrastructure projects at the time we're allowing white suburban dwellers who fled the city to get away from these undesirables to travel quickly in and out of the city via freeway. It also was meant to try and grab these lands for commercial and capital investment. When the North, when we found out about the Northeast Falls Creek planning process, it wasn't because the city of Vancouver had invited black residents to weigh in. We found out, we saw that their promotional materials was actually not including the black citizens. It didn't represent this really important history. So we said, hang on, wait a minute. Um, if you're gonna do this big redevelopment, if you're gonna redevelop the, the site and remove the, the viaducts, you really have a job here to bring some restorative justice or some reparations, redress, you know, those kinds of concepts to bear here. There was a grave injustice that allowed the city to acquire those lands and destroy the black community. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the path forward didn't seem to recognize any of that. So it was really community that said, hang on, hang on, we need to be consulted and we need to be included. So we worked with the city through that um, consultation process. It was clear to us as we worked through the process that the city didn't really have the kinds of um, bandwidth or understanding of systemic racism, of anti-Black racism and how it shows up in policy. So we did a lot of educating through that process. Many members of the community were involved expressing the issues that were facing Black people in this region and why when this redevelopment was happened, we needed to see benefits come out of it for people of African descent in the area. So that's what we got involved with. And, and it was, there's a lot of interventions. We, you know, through the work that we were doing, we came up with an idea for a community land trust. Community land trust um, in North America started in Georgia and it started during the civil rights movement. It was a way for black farmers to acquire and hold sites in common because they were facing so much discrimination um, from the prevalent white uh, institutions, um, the prevalent uh, anti-black racism there. So that model of kind of common ownership, shared ownership, and then shared benefit, we thought was the perfect idea for what could happen 
when the Georgia and Dunsmuir viaducts uh, came out uh, of the Northeast Falls Creek area. What we would like to see is that 70%, that all of its rental housing that is actually built in that mixed use development, and that at least 70% of it is below market rates. That was what we envisioned would create a, a really inclusive community. It would be a community that prioritizes people that are struggling, you know, to live in Vancouver and afford housing. And that we would also have a cultural center and small commercial spaces that would be really, really beneficial for um, business owners and small entrepreneurs and social enterprise that really struggle in Vancouver to have affordable space. Now, in my role at BC Housing, I have a provincial mandate and work with my colleagues provincially. And what's really clear to us is that, you know, we want to better serve the communities that we are tasked with representing and that is going to take a big shift for us to really bring those voices into the center of the organization be really intentional about how we build partnerships and enable um, communities to be a part of the of the work we're doing and and to be really central into that so that's the other part of the hat that i wear is you know being really intentional about how we bring in the voices of marginalized communities. Those are racialized groups, you know, to us LGBTQIA plus communities, um, people with disabilities or disabled people, obviously indigenous people on these, their ancestral and unceded lands where they experience some of the, the highest levels of homelessness. So we've got a lot, um, you know, that we're wrapping our heads around at BC Housing as well to be setting ourselves up to make sure that our policy is much more structured to deliver um, on all the intentions we have to be equitable in our work. We already know that the people who have the least polluting impact, the lowest carbon footprint, are feeling the highest impacts of climate change because of poverty, because of their disability, because of their racial identity. You know, these are the people that are now going to have to bear the burden. You think about on these really smoky days we had last year, if you couldn't go indoors with clean air, if you were homeless, if you were living in substandard housing and didn't have the right filtration systems, what were you going to do? You know, and so we are very keenly aware, especially through the pandemic, that our job in the recovery effort has to prioritize people who are having the, the, the hardest impacts. There's so many groups in this province that are not fully at the table some of them are not even thought of at the table and so i think the education process has really got to be one that's anti-oppression we've got to kind of train our lens on you know how did we get here what were the thought processes what were the million billion decisions that were made through the settlement of these lands by colonial colonial interests the extraction of wealth um, from the many to the hands of the few, the economic exclusion that many people face because of what they look like and where they come from and what languages they speak and what, you know, faith they practice. You know, it's, it's right across the board that we've got to be super intentional about going who is, is impacted. You know, we, we got to look at where we have privilege we have opportunity to really alleviate oppression, not to put ourselves in as the savior or as the spokesperson. I hear a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to give this person a voice. People have a voice. What they don't have is opportunity. What they have are barriers and suppression and oppression of their voice. So we've got to kind of change our thinking on that a little bit as well, so that it's not a matter of, um, you know, people who are, who are kind of sitting over top of and overarching, making decisions that involve other people's lives. We have to bring those folks to the table, give them the power and the resources for the solutions that they seek and, and really empower that. We really got to kind of realize that we've got a common foe and that common foe is a scarcity mindset because scarcity says, I got to hoard everything and you can't have anything instead of realizing that this is an abundant planet, we've got more than enough um, to share and to pass around. And we need to be thinking that way instead of, you know, this idea that I, I've got to hold on to everything and I've got to have five houses and you get to be homeless. Like we really have to see our policymakers 
and put and put pressure on them to kind of address those inequities because otherwise left unchecked this gap is getting bigger and it and it's just taking over more and more people's lives students really are in a very unique position in society you are right now studying and learning and exploring concepts and it doesn't matter what discipline you come from you could infuse every single thing from health education sciences business doesn't matter you can always infuse it with an anti oppression lens you could always bring equity to your work you could always ask how do i use these hard skills i'm getting to create the world i actually want to live in And now we've reached the end of our season. Throughout this season, we've wanted to explore all the ways sustainability can be personal to each individual, and we've shared so many wonderful conversations with different members of our community. Just seeing how everyone holds their individual power in contributing meaningfully, whether it's being vocal in the spaces they're in, initiating sustainable innovations, helping education become accessible, and bringing pressing matters to the forefront of conversations. With our series, our intention has been to share different stories, creating dialogue to understand that when we talk about the different answers to a solution, we have to approach it with regards to the needs of all people. When we talk about sustainability, we are considering the different experiences and capacities of individuals that make up the very spaces we're trying to make sustainable. Thank you for joining us on this season of Sustainability Circle, and we hope you can continue to be a part of our organization. Make sure to check our description below to find more resources and to learn more about Embark, our events, and our programming. Thanks for watching.